Medical Specialists Associates, making medical education more accessible. I would now like to introduce Dr. Christopher Voskopoulos, President, Medical Specialist Associate. The floor is now yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me tonight. Um, this is a, a fun topic for me to present. Uh, among other things, I am a board-certified critical care doctor. But prior to the ultrasound approach to gastrostomy, um, I'm also a critical care doctor that was regularly performing PEG placements, gastrostomy tubes with the uh, EGD scope, as well as some radiographic guided um, as well. And so when this new technology came through, it was very interesting for me. And I began to navigate my, my practice towards using this as my preferred technique for my routine standard cases in the ICU. And so during the course of this presentation, I am going to present in such a light where I'll compare and contrast a little bit to the other techniques uh, that are available and why I personally navigated to this technique. So myself and my company uh, does run a training course for this Pumadri uh, cha uh, training uh, technique. Um, in Las Vegas, and this talk here is sponsored by Coaptech. Sorry, I just got used to these buttons. Um, so an outline here, we'll talk a little bit about the current practice of gastrostomy tube placement. Then we'll talk about the PUG procedure, and I'll provide one overview slide video, and then we'll provide some breakout slides. Um, well, go over the information in a little bit more depth and just kind of point out some of the interesting or unique parts uh, of this particular gastrostomy tube placement technique. We'll also then talk about PUG implementation, um, and then we'll talk about some process reengineering and then combining this in the ICU with our tracheostomies that we commonly do bedside. And then we'll talk a little about current outcomes. We'll also have some polling questions. And I'd ask that you please do participate in those questions as will give me the opportunity to understand you, the audience, a little more, and I could curtail the talk a little bit more to maybe your interests. And then hopefully we'll end a bit early here, and in doing so, I want to be able to open the floor to some questions and answers. So here, let's review our current gastrostomy options. Well, of course, we have our endoscopic gastrostomy tube approach. And then most often our interventional radiology colleagues might perform the radiographic, uh, radiographic approach. Our surgery colleagues most often perform the open gastrostomy approach. But now here, there's a new approach, ultrasound guided. And this new approach is really uniquely suited for critical care doctors because it really just builds upon common critical care techniques and skills that critical care doctors have already that are commonly seen in such procedures, say, as like a central line placement. Now, I want to emphasize here that though this is a new procedure um, that is available to critical care doctors, this procedure will not completely do away with the other techniques. There will still be a point in time to where it is more appropriate to do a EGD approach. Say if an individual maybe had concern for evaluation for gastritis or bleeding or other upper GI bleeds, of course, that individual could benefit from the EGD approach because more diagnosis could take place. Or let's say if we're doing our ultrasound approach and we encounter bowel, well, our interventional radiology colleagues might maybe have better success with a fluoroscopic guided approach. Or let's say if we encounter individuals that have prior gastric surgery, say a sleeve gastrectomy or wound Y gastric bypass surgery, well, then those individuals might be more appropriate for the open uh, procedure. So a first poll question here is, do you think your institution and patients could benefit from more timely G2 placements? I'll just pause here for a minute. And I'm gonna end the poll now. Uh, I think we have just about enough answers there. And so it does seem as if 
Uh, most people in the audience could benefit from more timely G2 placements. But let's understand this maybe a little bit more why we ask this question. Let's understand our current workflow that we see. Well, right now, most commonly, if we're going to do either the PEG uh, approach or the radiographic approach, what we would have to do here is have a discussion first with the family and then consult our physician colleague who would be performing the procedure. Then that colleague would have to come and evaluate the patient. And then depending upon if the procedure would be done in the endo suite or whether or not the endo suite would have to come up to the ICU or whether or not this individual might have to go down to interventional radiology, there has to be transport. And then there would have to be anesthesia, which has to come uh, to the bedside and to assist for a procedural sedation for this procedure uh, or to the endo suite. And then we have to have techs come to the suite, the proceduralists come to the suite, and then the procedure is performed and then transport back to the ICU. So here, this is a new process, which is much more streamlined. And here we simply, as the critical care team, consent the family for the procedure, and then we convene at the bedside to perform the procedure, and then the procedure is performed. And so when we look at really incorporating some of the best knowledge from other fields, say business with lean Six Sigma technology, you can just see here some of the greater efficiencies that can be offered by having the pug perhaps maybe be the procedure of choice for routine standard gastrostomy tube placements. And those efficiencies, we'll talk about cost savings, as well as perhaps maybe some better outcomes for patients. So this next polling question here is, is what is the most common cause of gastrostomy delay for you? Now, sorry, you got a few options here, and I'll, I'll pause for a minute to allow you to read them. Yeah, now this is interesting here. I guess we could uh, pause here for a minute and just review some of these. Um, this is really institution specific, but um, I, I do work at enough institutions to where I can relate to all of these answers. I mean, sometimes um, there isn't a specialist available, especially say maybe on the weekends uh, where it might be very difficult to uh, consult one of your specialist colleagues. Um, or there could be procedural space availability concerns, especially in the IR suite if you have a busy IR service where it's difficult to schedule what is maybe viewed more as an elective procedure. Um, and then uh, scheduling, uh, we talked about uh, weekends. Um, and then again, if this is considered elective, it could be bumped uh, as well. So we'll end this poll here. And so this is the first video that we're gonna show here. And this first video here has no audio. So I'm gonna talk over it. And this is a brief overview of the procedure, and then we'll jump into it a little bit more depth. Let's go ahead and play this here. And one of the first things that you'll notice here is that this procedure is just taking place in a standard ICU room, and we have a standard prep and drape. Here you see our magnet and then our orogastric balloon with a magnetic tip inside of it. Here we see just a simple oral gastric tube placement and feeding down towards the stomach. And then here we can use our magnet to align that balloon. Here now we're going to place our ultrasound and fill the balloon with some saline to visualize the balloon. Here's what we would expect to see under ultrasound guidance for the balloon here. And now we will simply have needle puncture. Really, again, no difference than a central line placement into, say, an internal jugular. We will then have retrieval of fluid back. Here we're using blue fluid to help another added level of safety because there isn't any other fluid in the body that is blue that would return. And then once we have that confirmation here, using our standard Selgender technique, we simply pass a guide wire into the balloon. And now, once that guide wire is in the balloon, we will begin the process then of retrieving the guide wire by pulling back the oral gastric balloon. And then here, in just a moment here, we'll see the wire come out. 
And now this wire will provide us our guidance for our gastrostomy tube to be placed over it and now to be ultimately pulled down into the stomach and then out through the skin, establishing our gastrostomy. So this procedure here, you know, is commonly uh, completed in uh, 15 minutes. Um, as one does more procedures, and especially if a patient's anatomy is very accommodating, um, this procedure, for myself at least, has been done uh, in less than five minutes. Um, so here, uh, I will advance, and we could come off this video slide here. Thank you. And so. Before we go into some of the other you know, unique aspects of this procedure here, let's just talk about some indications and contraindications. Well, they're basically generally the same as a PEG or a radiographic gastrostomy tube approach. Of note here, um, this technology here does use a magnet to bring up that oral gastric balloon up to the anterior portion uh, of the stomach. And so we have to be conscious of other electronic devices, say things like pacemakers, or spinal cord stimulators or intrathecal pumps. The device is FDA approved for individuals age 21 or greater. Here it says that the device is approved for BMI of 20 to 30, but I wanna go into this a little bit more in depth that since this technology uses a magnetic approach, well, what we need is, is that we need to have the magnet here and there needs to be a certain amount of depth to allow the magnet to still have strength to pull up that oral gastric balloon up to coapt with the magnet. And generally speaking or so, that's about a you know maximum depth or say uh, or we would say about 4.5 centimeters. Now that's not something absolute. I myself have done procedures where um, I had tracks that were as long as 6.5. Um, but really, the bigger takeaway point here is it's less really about the BMI and more about this length, because as we know, BMI is not a perfect measure, especially in this regard, and we could easily have an individual with a BMI of 40 that might have a track of four centimeters, or that same, or a different individual might have a BMI of 40 and their track could be 10, and that could be a much different approach. And this also here illustrates why um, this technique will be great and have why I have adopted it for my standard, you know, ICU procedures, but there are certain patients that aren't going to be good candidates for it and why there will still be use for the EGD approach or the open approach or the radiographic approach. So here, this is a standard setup. And for really any critical care doctor, this just looks very familiar. This is very akin to a central line uh, set up here. And now next, we're going to show some videos here, and these do have audio. I'll let the video run, and then I'll just comment on them. So this first video here. And after we've already lubricated the balloon, now what we want to do is go ahead and introduce it into the mouth, down into the stomach. Why I wanted to present this is that for those of us that have watched, say, our gastroenterology colleagues do a EGD approach, you'd be familiar that there has to be insufflation. And we use approximately 250 cc's of air of insufflation because we want to fill the stomach to allow the stomach to come up to the anterior portion of the body closer to the skin. And so since we're not doing an EGD approach, what is left in the patient is a nasogastric tube. And then we could insufflate the stomach with that nasogastric tube. You can either do it directly from the wall or you can simply use a hand syringe. We'll play this next video. Please go ahead and start it. And then next here, we want to go ahead and push our blue dye into the balloon. About this part that I just wanted to comment in reference to this ultrasound guided approach. And that is that we had the magnet here 
um, at the upper quadrant, upper left quadrant uh, of the patient. And that magnet helps to bring the orogastric balloon up into that area. And what that provides is, is an ideal tract for placement of gastrostomy. Ideal in reference to if you wanted to convert a G to a J tube, you have your track already facing the py pylorus. And that's a big advantage of being able to manipulate that magnet over there into that region. The other thing you saw that in order for us to enable our ultrasound guided technique, we needed to fill the balloon with saline because of course air is the enemy of ultrasound, but by filling the balloon with saline, we're able to visualize it. Now here we have our simple targeting uh, of the balloon. And after training many people from interventional radiologists to surgeons to anesthesiologists, it's interesting because for this particular technique here, uh, you'll commonly maybe see some of the critical care doctors who feel just more comfort with out-of-plane techniques, here puncturing the balloon in front of the ultrasound probe or maybe behind, but an out-of-plane technique. Whereas conversely, maybe for an interventional radiologist, they might feel more comfortable with an in-plane technique from coming from the side here and visualizing the needle the entire way. Conversely, maybe a lot of anesthesiologists who are familiar with regional anesthesia techniques also maybe prefer an in-plane approach. I just point this out here because it's, it's important to know all the different approaches that you can have to the balloon because depending on someone's anatomy, you could change things up and adapt to what the best approach is for that patient. So here's a question for you. Do you worry about bowel perforation as a complication with PEG? So I'll end this poll here. And the majority of people did say yes. Um, I could understand maybe if, if someone said no, um, uh, now, uh, you know, it's an opportunity for me to, you know, relate to this question personally. And, and one of the reasons why I navigated to this technique is that after myself performing, uh, the peg approach routinely, I guess I've always had a little bit of discomfort in that ultimately, even though I would bring my EGD scope up to the skin and see the light and tap, you know, on the area and see if there was direct transmission, um, uh, into the stomach. I still know that I was doing the procedure blind. Um, it really reminded me of when I navigated away from blind central line techniques to ultrasound, to where on the rare occasion that I have to do a blind technique, maybe in an emergency or otherwise, I still feel a little uncomfortable that I'm not directly being able to visualize my track. And so for me, that added a level of confidence um, and a level of safety for me that I thought. Um, and so that was a big reason why for me to navigate over. And in discussing this with uh, other individuals, they've also related to this as well. So here we'll show targeting our balloon here. And we'll go ahead and play this video. So this is what we would be looking for here. We're looking for our balloon under ultrasound guidance. And here you can see the balloon come up right here. And then after we fill it up, that's nice. And then we could puncture the balloon. Now, since this, again, is direct guidance, what after doing several of these, maybe you could possibly see bowel uh, overlying the balloon. I have seen that, and I've had to abort one of my procedures. You could maybe see individuals with, say, excessively large livers, and say the left lobe of the liver is migrating very much so over to the left side. And you might see a piece of the liver there. But when you're ultrasound guided, then you could re-manipulate the balloon placement and then get the liver out of the way and go for puncture. But the main point here is that this is a direct guide, visual guided technique. And so if there is something in the way, you could either A, readjust to provide for a safe procedure, or B, abort if there's no way to adjust. So we'll continue with this video here. I then grab my wire. 
and I will pass my wire into the balloon. Under ultrasound guidance, we punctured it, and now we pass our wire. Again, this is a standard Selzinger technique, and I just wanted to point this out, that this is something that all critical care doctors are really familiar with, with their central line placements. This is just a re-adaptation of a technology and a technique that we're familiar with. Now we'll come here to this next video. Now recall here that our wire is just simply curled up into the Coptec orogastric balloon, balloon apparatus. It's not a solid connection to where you can just simply pull out the orogastric balloon. It's enough of the connection to where what you need to do is as you pull back on the orogastric tube, you need to feed in more wire. We call it the pull and push technique. And I'll show you what that curled wire looks like in the orogastric balloon, but I wanted to draw a distinction here. If um, uh, anyone recalls when maybe they're watching their GI colleagues place uh, a peg, um, a peg a gastrostomy tube, they commonly use a pull technique to where when the wire comes out of the mouth, they'll lasso it around the, um, uh, the gastrostomy tube, and then they'll pull it in. Well, this is a bit different. This is ultimately a push technique, which we'll talk about, but that connection isn't as strong. And so what I don't want is individuals just pulling the orogastric tube um, uh, straight out. What you have to do is really feed the wire in, which is something that's very easy to do, but it's an important distinction to make. And then here, you could see the connection that it makes right here. So the wire comes in and it curls up in the orogastric balloon here, providing that connection but you can see that you could apply enough force if you wanted to, and you could pull that wire out, which is why that we use that pull and that push technique concomitantly. So now here, once the wire is out of the patient's mouth right here, then we simply go ahead and feed our gastrostomy tube. So we're currently using a push technique here in contrast to the peg, which is that more commonly that pull approach here. And we simply then feed the gastrostomy tube over the wire and then ultimately bring it out the anterior portion of the patient's stomach. So here I'll, I'll shift gears a little bit and now we'll start talking about PUG implementation, physician training, local politics and credentialing, clinical specialist support, and then Q&A, and then cost and reimbursement. So in terms of training, there are a variety of options. There are two live training options. Uh, one, as I mentioned, with myself um, in Las Vegas, and then one in Baltimore with Coaptech. Um, however, and it's important to know here in our current day and age of COVID, where we still don't know where maybe things are going, that there also is virtual training that is available to where phantoms can be shipped out to uh, locations and a virtual option could take place uh, if needed. Coaptech can also provide on-site um, in-service uh, training uh, as well uh, if needed. So what does this look like for implementation? Well, it would depend on the division that is currently maybe running the ICU. Um, if it is a medicine ICU, perhaps maybe a conversation first with the chief of medicine, or if it's a neurocritical care unit, perhaps maybe a conversation with the chief of neurology or it could be an anesthesia-based critical care unit, and perhaps maybe a conversation with the chief of anesthesia, or possibly maybe a discussion with the CMO. And then discussion with your GI, IR, and surgery colleagues. And how these conversations go is it is all dependent upon the institution that you find yourself in. At many of the institutions that I work at and some of my colleagues work at, our GI colleagues, for one reason or another, were more than willing to uh, offload this. Um, um, in some instances, they have extremely busy outpatient practices, and it's quite difficult um, to interrupt that outpatient practice to come into the hospital for these procedures. Um, or in some instances, interventional radiology is overwhelmed uh, with the number of procedures that they're asked to do, and they welcome to have slightly less procedures. And these individuals are comforted when you mention that you will still need to consult them for gastrostomy tube placements. This is not a complete replacement 
that you'll be working together. You'll be yet another physician who could provide this service. And then credentialing is really site specific. Um, um, say at my particular site, when I was already credentialed for gastrostomy two placements, um, it was quite easy for me to add this particular skill. And say surgeons and interventional radiologists um, might have a similar experience because they are already concurrently uh, placing gastrostomy tubes. Um, however, maybe for some critical care doctors, they might be required to attend a course to have a certificate of completion of training and then to be proctored uh, for a certain number uh, of cases. However, once physicians are trained, then physicians can train each other. And then say at my particular location, we're now incorporating this technique into our anesthesia critical care fellowship program and teaching our fellows uh, this uh, particular technique as an example. So in terms of PUG implementation and the clinical special support that is available, so QAPTEC is available with cl uh, clinical specialists on site. They could be on site for the first 10 cases, or they could be available via telehealth. Um, what this looks like via telehealth, and I participated in this, um, is that the company can send you a HIPAA compliant iPad, and then there will be a secure uh, Zoom connection uh, to the company to where they could help proctor you, perhaps do cases, or provide feedback um, uh, uh, during cases. And this is quite helpful. Um, to get this live feedback um, for you to really kind of refine your technique. And then uh, during this day and age, it's important during COVID-19 uh, right now, it's important to really emphasize this maybe virtual training option um, because this has been particularly helpful um, during COVID-19 when the economy was really kind of shut down and travel was uh, so difficult. Um, and again, I was actually one of these sites that participated in uh, virtual implementation and it worked quite well. So now, what will this look like in terms of when you implement a, a PUG and then a steady state? Well, you could have some increasing efficiency of care. What happens is you will now adopt this procedure um, into your procedure armamentarium, and then you'll have stream, uh, streamlined supplies, and you could have a cart, uh, which is what we have done. We have uh, incorporated this into a cart, and all of our particular materials are there. And then what we have also done then is we have um, bundled this procedure with our tracheostomies. And then we have trained our advanced practice providers as well as some of the RNs to help us uh, uh, in this particular procedure. This further streamlines and make the procedure even quicker when you have all this setup done ahead of time. And you might have some assistance by your RN colleagues as well. When you reach a steady state and you understand how many of these procedures you'll be performing on average per month, there could be volume-based purchasing, which could also reduce uh, costs. Then in terms of reimbursement, at the current moment, there is a CPT code um, available, which is listed uh, down here for the ultrasound guided approach. This is a category three CPT code. As some of you might be familiar, category three codes are not yet assigned RVU base units. But once they are, it is expected that reimbursement would be on par with other gastrostomy uh, procedure techniques. So I think this is our last polling question here is, is do you currently perform percutaneous tracheostomy? Okay. The majority of people, I have five answers here for people who do and three that, um, that do not. Um, so for those that currently do perform uh, percutaneous uh, tracheostomies, um, you will be able to relate as I move on here. And for those that don't, maybe I would encourage you to have perhaps maybe try to incorporate that skill into your practice just so that you can com uh, combine these techniques. Because when we talk about really en uh, enhanced process reengineering, Combining both the percutaneous tracheostomy and the gastrostomy two placement, which are two procedures that are most commonly performed together anyway. There are rarer instances where we only place a gastrostomy tube um, and even rarer instances when we only place a tracheostomy. But for the most part, these are coupled. And when we couple these, in terms of what I mentioned before about uh, lean practice improvement, you can see significant reductions in length of stay and by extrapolation, 
cost reduction. And so here in this particular paper here, by combining both the tracheostomy and gastrostomy in one particular episode, well, what you see then is you can see reductions in length of stay by up to eight days. And that's huge. And then when you translate how expensive it is for an ICU day, especially in the United States, you could easily have cost reductions of $35,000 for patients. And so this could be huge. But this is just not only perhaps maybe about cost. When we think about this here, it's also about patient outcomes. And what I mean by that is that in our current maybe standard you know, operational procedures, when we decouple these procedures, the patient has to undergo two separate anesthesias, two separate sedations, and they have to then recover from their sedation and perhaps maybe even recover from paralysis if they got paralysis for one or both um, of these procedures. But it's not just about paralysis and or maybe sedation. It's also about things such as anticoagulation because often our patients are anticoagulated for one reason or another. And perhaps maybe anticoagulation might need to be held once and then twice for the second procedure instead of just once. And that further exposes perhaps maybe our patients to say things like BBT risks, uh, et cetera, but not even just maybe anticoagulation feeding. As we know, appropriate feeding is so important for um, you know, better outcomes in the ICU. And uh, our patients would have to be NPO, not once, but twice if these procedures are decoupled. And so here we can have just one episode of NPO status and then have better nutrition uh, moving forward. So we see that right here um, in uh, the table form that in our current approach right here, where we do the trach and then the G-tube here, the trach is just being done uh, first is that we have to consent the family and then consult our either ENT or interventional pulmonology colleague. Those individuals will then do evaluation. They'll then consent the family. They'll then schedule the procedure. Anesthesia will then come to the ICU or to the suite. We have to get the equipment available. First sedation is given. There's placement of the bronchoscope uh, for the uh, tracheostomy. Then the bronchoscope has to be sent for sterilization. And the patient has to recover. And then it's this process here where the patient then has to recover. And then you have to go through the exact same process again for the gastrostomy tube placement. Whereas here with the combined tracheostomy and G2 placement, you can see a much more streamlined lean process right here, which is simple. Consenting the family, providing sedation, and then both procedures are done. And these procedures could easily be done in approximately an hour. Uh, if not less. It's really all about preparation and the setup, but, but you could easily do these procedures maybe in as little as uh, 35 to 40 minutes or so combined. And then with the combined procedures here, again, just to emphasize the cost savings um, uh, for the hospital and for the patient. And so in this current age, uh, I'd be amiss if I just didn't mention something directly related to uh, COVID-19. This has really consumed our life now going on for the second year um, in the critical care world. But you can see the overwhelming benefit uh, of this particular technique to where if patients at your institution needed to be transported, say, to the endoscopic suite or to interventional radiology, and they're COVID-19 positive, well, that is a risk that you would rather not take in transporting that patient. They're better off staying in their negative isolation Room. Well, here with the pug technique, they can stay in their negative isolation room, and you can simply do this procedure here at the bedside. But also, perhaps maybe what you might have encountered at your institution or know some of your colleagues might have encountered is that it might have been difficult to find uh, specialists to perform gastrostomy tubes. And there could have been extreme delays in some instances uh, I'm familiar with to where patients had to test negative for COVID-19 after being treated for gastrostomy tube placement. And that added sometimes up to 14 or more days um, to wait for this procedure uh, to be done. And then in terms of doing this procedure safely uh, in the COVID-19 uh, uh, positive patient, this was a nice poster presentation at CHEST, uh, before, uh, which was presented recently. And it just talks about things such as wearing pappers, et cetera, to provide this uh, technique in the most safe manner possible. So here are just two slides um, about current outcomes. And this was a recent paper here from Columbia University. And what they did was is they compared 
the ultrasound guided gastrostomy tube approach to the radiogastric approach. And here for this particular conclusion, what they found was is they found that PUG is similar in terms of complications to the radiographic approach to placement and a safe method for gastrostomy tube placement in the critically ill with the added benefits of bedside placement, of course, the elimination of radiation exposure, and the expanded and improved access to care. So now this was a head-to-head -head comparison between the radiographic approach and the ultrasound-guided approach. Some might be questioning, well, what about the PEG approach? Well, there currently is no head-to-head -head comparison that is currently published um, as of yet, but I would draw your attention to this 2016 uh, Cochrane Database uh, System Review. And here they just noted that there are no randomized controlled trials that compare PEG with the radiographic approach. And that they found that based on their evidence that was you know, currently reviewed uh, for this paper, that PUG and the radiographic approach can be safely performed in select individuals, although both are associated with my, major and minor complications. So the reason why I mentioned this here is that since this compared PEG to the radiographic approach and the prior patient, uh, the prior paper compared the ultrasound guided gastrostomy approach to the radiographic approach, one would can then extrapolate reasonably well that the ultrasound guided gastrostomy uh, tube uh, approach would be on par with the safety of a PEG placement as well. And with that, I intentionally tried to end here a little early to leave some time for some questions. And so I, uh, I welcome uh, any questions that uh, the audience might have. And I see a first question right here. It's gonna take me a second. Uh, after procedure, when can we start using the PEG uh, tube placement? This is really the same as any gastrostomy tube uh, approach. Um, it does vary a little bit by practice patterns, but in general, we wait at least 12 hours. Um, some institutions wait up to 24. As far as credentialing goes, does a, uh, I'm sorry, next question here um, I'll take right now is, as far as credentialing goes, does a live event need to be attended to be credentialed? Well, it really depends upon your particular institution. And um, as uh, you are likely familiar with, um, each hospital's medical staff uh, really creates their own rules in terms of who could be credentialed for what procedures and what requirements have to be met for those procedures. And so it's really all over the board. So the best is to have a conversation. Um, and if you have to attend a live event, we would love to see you in Las Vegas. But if not, there are other options that are available to you. Next question here is, when performing PUG, do you see a squeezed colon between stomach and abdominal wall? And so um, I um, uh, have done this procedure, and um, luckily enough for me, I had done a few of them. And so I felt comfortable in visualizing the balloon. And then during one procedure, I couldn't visualize the balloon. And I spent a really long time looking Eventually, I got a KUB, and boom, there was Frank Cullen uh, right in the way. Um, and um, that brings an important point in, in that there will be an acceptable number of times to where you abort this procedure because of that particular maybe instance or other instances to where you can't see the balloon. Really, this is no different than, let's say, if you set up for a right internal jugular central line and you saw massive thrombosis. Um, in that uh, internal jugular vein, you would simply abort the procedure and either explore a different technique to go in. So again, that since, since this is also an image-guided technique, you use the same, really common sense if you can't visualize the balloon. Um, it's also you know, the reason why uh, the other approaches will still be used because in this particular instance, my interventional radiology colleagues had better success uh, to safely perform this procedure. I'll take the next question here, which is, what is your abdominal wall thickness limit um, to do it safely? Um, I now, you know, personally, and I'm just speaking for, uh, you know, personal comfort uh, after doing the procedure, have a comfort with about 6.5 centimeters um, uh, or so um, to do this procedure. Um, uh, I have yet have had the experience uh, or willingness to try it on individuals, you know, with, with much more uh, at the moment. Next question here is, are you able to visualize the colon using the PUG procedure? Um, so as we know, um, ultrasound does not 
um, uh, uh, visualized air well. And so more so what I will say is that you will start seeing ring down artifacts or other fart artifacts related to air because air is in the colon. And then most importantly, you don't visualize the balloon. So even if you're confused and you're not sure if you're seeing colon or not because of all the air artifacts and you're not sure what the image means, the most important takeaway point is that if you don't see that balloon, you don't have that clear track, you don't do the procedure. You bought the procedure there, if that, if that better answers your question. Next question here, I am credentialed to do PEG already. Would PUG require simple, uh, a separate credentialing? Really contingent upon your medical staff? Um, for me, no. Uh, well, actually, uh, for me, yes and no. To me, it was just an add-on, because it was a different technique of doing gastrostomy, which I was already doing. Um, it's really contingent upon your, your institution. I would start by having um, a conversation with your uh, medical staff to see what they uh, see what they require. So do you have to stop aspirin uh, or Plavix? And so currently right now, just as any procedure and any gastrostomy tube placement uh, in reference to uh, anticoagulation, we follow the same guidelines um, as any other uh, gastrostomy tube placement, even though that this one is image guided, still doesn't change um, uh, holding appropriate anticoagulation for the safety of the procedure. Um, for all that credentialing, I think uh, you were asking, uh, I'm going to go back to your question up here. I am credentialed to do PEG already. Would PUG require a separate uh, credentialing? Um, so uh, I, I guess maybe I'll elaborate a little more. I would, um, uh, I would say that um, if you're likely already uh, credentialed for gastrostomy tube placement with the uh, EGD scope, you'll have an easier time getting uh, privileged to do this. Since this is a separate procedure, it will commonly require separate credentialing. It'll just be much easier for you to incorporate this because you have comfort and familiarity with gastrostomy tube placement. Say, as compared to maybe some critical care doctors that have never performed a gastrostomy tube placement before, they might require additional training um, uh, to show their medical staff competency before being permitted to do this procedure. So this next question here is, you have to keep buying the magnet? No, the magnet is reusable. Um, and so the magnet is placed uh, in a sterile sleeve, and that is the magnet that you continue to uh, use um, for, the, uh, for all uh, further procedures done thereafter. Is the magnet able to coaptate tissue planes for high BMI patients? I think what you're referencing, um, uh, I hope I answered this question uh, correctly. If you recall a prior slide, when I showed that that since we're using a magnet technology, which I think is really cool because this is the only procedure that at least I perform and I'm really familiar with that uses a magnet um, as added benefit, as we know is that the strength of the magnet decreases as you get further and further away from the magnet. Um, and so that's why we mentioned that ideal distance of 4.5 centimeters or less because you have a very strong magnetic pull between here. It doesn't mean that you know magically you go past 4.5 centimeters and now you don't have any magnetic pull, it's just weaker. Um, but that would really be contingent upon how adept you are doing this procedure. If you're comfortable, if you're comfortable in positioning the patient, say in reverse Trendelenburg, and you get adequate insu uh, air insufflation into the stomach and you really bring that stomach up to the anterior portion uh, uh, you know, of, of the skin uh, uh, surface, um, you might be able to overcome some of those limitations and do this procedure uh, safely, if that answers your question. Rephrase, are you able to visualize the stool liquid-filled colon? Yes, I have been able to uh, visualize a constipated uh, colon uh, for an individual that was massively uh, backed up. That was a unique situation into where um, there was any, there was really no air really um, for the particular view that I happened uh, to see. So I was able to discern that anatomy. I probably find that more of a rarer event, but yes, I've seen it. I don't think I see any further questions. I hope I answered everyone's questions to their satisfaction. Um, I am available for uh, further questions. Um, I'm happy to get an email. Uh, my information is available online through our website. 
Uh, please contact me for any further questions, and I will be sure to, uh, to get back to you with uh, further information as you request. Oh, uh, I think I see maybe one more here. I apologize, repeat, how many procedures before your fellows feel comfortable with this procedure? About five. Um, but really, you know, really contingent upon, you know, that individual, right? So here, you know, for me, for example, you know, you're talking about anesthesia um, fellows who have done countless numbers of regional anesthesia nerve blocks, um, in addition to their, you know, central line placements and otherwise. And so they are very comfortable with, you know, with the ultrasound. Maybe sometimes that may or may not maybe be the case, you know, with some of our, you know, medicine colleagues, maybe they've just, uh, you know, performed maybe less you know, of these procedures, you know, during training and they might need a little more time. Or conversely, I've had some, you know, medicine colleagues who were extraordinarily adept in echocardiography and they were able to adapt those skills and they just flew with this, you know, kind of procedure. So it's ultimately more individual specific, um, especially as time goes on, right? All of our trainings blend and we all become the same as more time goes on. So individual specific is how I would answer that, but generally about five. What is the use of the blue dye? Thanks for uh, mentioning that again. Well, the blue dye is just simply because there uh, should not be another substance in the body that if we puncture, we should return blue dye. So it's added as an extra level of safety that if you get the blue dye back, you are in the balloon and you're not in anything else. Is the magnet too strong that it precludes use in patients with? No, um, uh, we just mentioned this because uh, you just need to be conscious of the fact that you're using a magnet, right? When someone is prepped and draped in a sterile fashion and you're just not thinking about it, it could be easy for you just to put, after using the magnet, to put it on the left, uh, you know, upper part of the patient's chest and whoops, um, that happens to be where their pacemaker is, right? Or conversely, maybe in the lower left quadrant where that patient might be has a spinal cord stimulator or something like this. So it's just meant for more for you to be conscious of the fact that you are using a magnet and to safely stay away from those structures as much as possible. Is there a case where the needle passes through the colon and to the stomach to get the blue dye? It's a great question and most likely not because if you had colon in front of the balloon, it would not be likely that you could visualize the balloon. And so since you weren't visualizing the balloon, you wouldn't attempt the procedure uh, via that track. The most important point here really to emphasize is, is you have to see the balloon. And if colon's in the way, you're not gonna see the balloon. All right, well, I think I will. Um, but it's colon filled with liquid instead of air, it's tough to detect. No, if the colon then is filled with uh, liquid, so um, um, uh, uh, um, maybe a better uh, example here is, you know, a case that I've had to where the left lobe of the liver uh, was very large and the left lobe of the liver was covering um, the balloon. And so ultimately I could see the balloon, but I could also see the left lobe of the liver. And so in this particular case, uh, perhaps what you're saying, if there is an air, you would see the colon. The anatomy would look different. It would look odd. You would be going through another structure on top. You would see that other structure on top. And you would know enough that since you have direct visualization, that you would uh, abort the procedure. Uh, perhaps maybe it's similar to saying, um, can you see the internal jugular vein if it is behind the carotid artery? You definitely could you wouldn't puncture the carotid artery to get into the vein. Or likewise, there could maybe be a gigantic lymph node, um, you know, lying over um, the internal uh, jugular vein. Again, you wouldn't go through that lymph node. You try to find a track that you can go around it. That answers your question. What is the cost of live training course and what does it entail? Um, the training is uh, free. Um, and the training uh, entails um, a little bit more than a half a day uh, to where we go over how to do this uh, technique using mannequins. Um, really what we found is using mannequins is, I think, maybe a preferred approach. Um, it's uh, simpler and, and really more actually lifelike. Um, you'd be surprised at how incredible these mannequins are right now to where we go over the procedure and we go over all of these very particular fine details, which is what all these procedures are about, right? It's about the fine details and you learning them. And that's what ends up bringing you, you know, success in the procedure 
and actually more efficiencies uh, uh, in doing it. And so we uh, present um, some of the videos maybe that you saw here just in much greater depth. Um, we talk about those fine details and then there's extensive time to practice the technique with um, say individuals such as myself going around um, and then helping you as you're performing the technique to hone in those skills. All right, I think um, that's our last question. I appreciate that last comment for thanking me on the presentation. Um, I think we will end here. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vaskopoulos, and thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar, The Intensivist Histronomy. If authorized by the sponsor, the webinar will be posted to the ATS YouTube channel in about two weeks. On behalf of Co-op Tech and our presenter, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for watching and learning with us today. If you're interested in taking this class for credit, or if you're interested in our other services, such as our direct clinical care services, please visit our website at www.med-specialist.net or click on the link in the description below. Also, make sure you subscribe to our channel to stay up to date on our most current content and educational opportunities.